Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the breakout session on renewable energy. Uh, I am Ian Thomas and I'm Managing Director of Floor here in the UK. And just for those who don't know Floor, we're the largest publicly held traded engineering company in the world based out of Dallas. And we have a major operation employing over 2,000 engineers in Farnborough in the UK. However, I'm here today as co-chair of the Offshore Wind Developers Suppliers Forum set up by DEC to encourage suppliers to participate in the massive expansion of offshore wind generation that this government is in the forefront of encouraging. We have on our panel today Greg Barker, uh, Minister of State for Climate Change in DEC. Uh, Greg has been a champion within the Conservative Party for a number of years, highlighting the, damage, the dangers of global warming. He helped steer the Climate Change Act through the House in 2008 whilst in opposition, and he is now the minister responsible for implementing that act. Also on the panel is Maf Smith, Deputy CEO of Renewable UK. Maf was involved for four years growing Scottish renewables to represent energy interests in Scotland, and now he brings that experience to Renewables UK, the trade and professional body for the UK wind and marine renewable industry. Again, we have Andrew Mill, Chief Executive Officer of NARAC. NARAC? <laughs> Andrew has worked in the energy industry for the whole of his career and has now grown NARAC into a worldwide multidiscipline RD and D facility, specialising in renewables, networks and energy technologies. Andrew also sits on a number of company boards involved in renewable energy. Finally, we have Jim Smith. Jim is Managing Director of SSE Renewables and has spent his whole career in the UK power industry. SSE has probably the largest portfolio of renewable opportunities in the UK and Ireland. And in fact, Floor and SSE are in joint venture developing a 3,500 megawatt offshore wind uh, project uh, offshore the Firth of Forth. Uh, that completes our panel. Greg Barker is uh, having a serious business meeting. He'll be here in about 20 minutes. So I'd like Math now to come up and make his presentation. Morning all. Okay, I have a very short amount of time and I have a lot of slides. So I, this is gonna be a bit of a whistle, whistle stop tour for you. But I want to do that so afterwards there's more information for you to take away. So I'm going to keep moving rapidly through, but I'll pull out some key information I think it's important for you to, to understand in terms of the perspective of the UK market. Firstly, to introduce Renewable UK. Renewable UK is the trade body. Uh, we represent companies involved in the wind, wave, tidal sector. We're the UK's largest uh, renewable trade body, and we have 690 members from a, a range of interests, manufacturing, development, supply chain. You heard this morning about the, the ambition and what the UK government is looking to achieve. To achieve those things, it's important that we have a strong industry, and that industry is well represented and strongly represented, working closely with governments to make sure that, that its voice is heard, government understands what industry needs, and that's what we do day in, day out. So if you do want more information about um, what our work and how we work alongside government and how we work to support companies like yourselves, do come and talk to me afterwards. In terms of moving on, what I want to do is talk you through the short term, where we are today, medium term, where things are going, and then the longer term. So in terms of snapshot for that, where we are today, uh, there's a lot happening in terms of, um, there's a lot of operational projects onshore, with some on offshore coming through. Onshore is the blue, offshore is the red. But as you can see, there's a lot with, that is already has planning and is in, under construction a lot further approved but not yet built, and then another pipeline of projects which are, are in the planning pipeline at the moment. In terms of how that looks, so looking at onshore, you can see there's been a steady development rate over time since 2004. Um, ups and downs in that, but a, a good pass, and cumulatively that, that working well. And similarly offshore, starting from a, a lower base, the the development path goes up and down, That's, that tends to be because of the way that the round structures that the UK has adopted works. 
So you get more in some years than others, but overall, again, you can see a very good cumulative development curve for offshore. Now, there are reasons to be cheerful. Onshore particularly, the industry has been working well and, and has a good track record. And what the industry is now looking to do is, is track that across into offshore. And that leads us on to the medium term. Some positive prospects, but storms ahead as well. Onshore, in the medium term, we've heard announced earlier today about the government decisions on the RO. They came out last week or so. Um, and the Minister talking about how it's important that evidence uh, informs policy and, and we too support that, that's very important. The government decisions on the onshore were 0.9 of a rock, the Renewable Obligation Certificate, those are important because that, that tracks forwards into the development path. And one of the messages we've said to the government is that cutting levels of support too quickly means we won't receive the benefits of that. And you can see from this graph different trajectories of where we could get to, where we might get to depending on different scenarios. We're pleased to see that onshore is doing well and we'll continue to have a good role. We'll be engaging with government to ensure that that carries on. And then offshore, the industry is rapidly moving offshore. Some people ask why. Well, clearly the resource offshore is very good um, and we're looking to capitalise upon that. Further reasons though, um, there's a, you've heard about the security supply and the fact that a lot of existing generation is closing, which is in the end of plant life. So there's a, a massive challenge in terms of replacing that. We have targets both UK and EU-wide in terms of renewables that, that are driving a lot of activity. Obviously the UK has leading climate change targets that go alongside the EU ones. And again, there's a driving political appetite and activity. And there's a demand for investment and jobs. And renewables is one of the big opportunities for this country and it's one that this country is seizing. By 2020, 8,000 jobs could be created in this sector. If you want more information about onshore and offshore, we have a database called UK Wind Energy Database. And there's a link there to it. You'll be able to go back and find that later. But we have data on all the projects um, existing and planned, which you can go and look at. In terms of offshore, then, let's look a bit more closely at offshore. In the medium term, so there's a, a lot happening in terms of the different rounds. So I talked about we've had round one, which is uh, projects broadly now being developed and operational, round two. And then the more significant round, round three, is now following. So a lot of projects coming through in each of those rounds, and that's leading to a very strong cumulative growth for the industry. Now the drivers are generally with us. We have uh, solid support for the obligation. We have questions about how that tracks forward into the future. Onshore wind is, a, is cheap. It's the, the technology, the renewable technology, able to be delivered at scale most cheaply. There are some political considerations about onshore. We need to manage those. We need to make sure that we take politicians and the wider community with us. But offshore, the situation is the reverse. There is a lot of political support for offshore, but questions about the costs. And the industry has been working very closely with government, the Offshore Wind Task Force, to look at cost reduction. We have targets to bring offshore costs down by 30%, which the industry has signed up to. Government itself, we've heard about the electricity market reform process, and we're engaging with government closely to make sure that, that works for renewables. Indeed, I spent the last 12 months seconded into government working on electricity market reform. And also we're talking and, and supporting the marine sector, which coming on behind offshore wind will be very important. So longer term, offshore, the industry is now focused on round three, the most significant offshore round. This is important both in terms of recognising the challenges we face, but also the, the scale and the level of opportunity here. For, the, for those of you looking at investing in the UK, looking at learning what the offshore wind sector is doing, there's a lot of opportunity given the timescales of some of these projects. And just to show you here, this is the timescale that the, a, a typical offshore wind farm will take to get from conception through to construction and then operation and final decommissioning. There are a number of scenarios as to how quickly offshore wind will develop and, and the scale of offshore wind, but a central scenario adopted indicates that 18 gigawatts could be deployed by 2020. And then going on from that up to 40 gigawatts by 2030. Different scenarios there, but there is a, a significant amount of offshore wind being put forward by companies in the development pipeline, which is certainly going to help us. Now, 
that, is, that level of development is enough to secure a strong manufacturing base. And there's a lot of work being done by a number of companies to looking at sites, which will allow us to secure some of the, the, the benefits of that. The opportunity is uh, 23 gigawatts by 2020, which is a medium-term healthy growth scenario. That could see 69 billion of private investment coming into the sector, 25,000 direct jobs by 2020, 1 billion pounds investment in uh, factories alone, and um, 800 million tons CO2 avoided. And importantly for the government, it's, we can demonstrate that 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 will not only provide those jobs, but it provide revenues, and that would provide 14 billion pounds support back into the Treasury in terms of taxes and Crown estate leases. So an industry that's playing its part to help this country's economy remain strong. But while we can talk about future benefits, there are a lot of benefits we've already realised in this sector. So over 3,000 full-time jobs now, there's a, there's a lot of work as I've said, Siemens for example, only just one of the companies looking to invest and a much wider supply chain that's proving very successful. Some coming in from oil and gas, but other manufacturing sectors already doing well within this industry. But it's not just turbines, there's a huge supply chain, particularly around the offshore sector, and surveying, foundations, civil work, operation and maintenance. And we're seeing a huge growth in that sector coming in behind the developers, behind the manufacturers. And, and again, there are opportunities for companies like yourself, so please do come and talk to us if you're interested in learning more about that. And then briefly, I want to talk about Wave and Tidal. It's an important sector for our association, for many of our members. Many of our members are involved in the wind sectors, but also looking at an interest in the Wave and Tidal sector. There's a lot of joint ventures now coming in with early startups, early manufacturers now partnering with developers and energy supply companies and manufacturers, and that looks very interesting. There's a lot for this technology to do. There are a lot of um, technology variants, a lot of companies who are trialling uh, devices, and what we're going to see is a lot of learning over the next couple of years and, and some standardisation of that. But in terms of projects we have, as you can see here, starting from a very low base, but rapid growth is expected for this sector um, in terms of early projects leading to um, test arrays and then commercial projects. A lot of the activity is focused around the Penton Firth, the Orkneys and Shetland where some very good resources. Um, the, the European Marine Energy Centre is also based on Orkney with a test site for wave and tidal. And, and there are um, development rounds led uh, by the Crown Estate up there which are helpful. Also work out in Northern Ireland as well and 300 megawatts round being talked about there. And we further, as technology develops, we expect to see development around the English and Welsh coastline as well and Welsh Government particularly is very interested in that. So in total, the Government's proposals for renewables, one of its key documents is its roadmap which came out in 2011. Um, and that sh this shows you the development path that we could achieve. There is support from government to back that up. There's support in terms of a 20 million pound marine fund. The Scottish government itself has an 18 million pound fund. Uh, announced recently is that there'll be five rocks, the renewable obligation certificate, to support uh, wave and tidal. To put that in context, context onshore wind receives 0.9 and offshore wind receives 1.8 under the, the, those regimes as well as a much wider range of, of economic development support and industrial support. So a lot of challenges ahead for this sector, but a lot of support um, and a very good public-private partnerships to make sure that we can capitalise on the, the, the resource potential we have. That's important for a number of reasons. One is that there is already very high UK content in, in this sector. So for example, for example, Acmarine, 95% UK, MCT, approximately 75%. Those companies are attracting investment from UK and internationally as well. Goods test facilities, you'll hear from Andrew at NAREC, also we have EMEC, um, and a, a wide range of prototypes at demonstration stage moving rapidly forwards. Um, funding is key to that, but equally is the, the wider investor confidence. We're seeing companies like TGL, Rolls-Royce, MCT, um, with their links to Siemens, Aquamarine links to ABB, demonstrating that there are, there are very uh, very strong um, international partnerships with significant engineering and technological expertise now looking to make the marine sector a success. 
If you're interested in more, then um, come find out about Renewable UK, our annual conference coming up later this year. That's in Glasgow. So please do come along if you, you'd like to find out or speak to me later. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's interesting, just looking at the number of people in this room, uh, I think, as you know, there's a parallel stream of nuclear taking place uh, just in one of the adjacent rooms. So it looks like there may be about six or seven people in there discussing nuclear. Uh, and who would have said that about renewables 30 years ago? Uh, an interesting anecdote. I'd just like to make one apology uh, before I start. And I was actually finishing off what I was going to say today, yesterday afternoon. So I might get to a few points in this script where it says, come on, Andy. Uh, what a fantastic achievement. Uh, absolutely tremendous. SSE are the UK's largest renewable energy generator. In many ways, the growth of renewables in the company is a reflection of growth within the UK as a whole. I'm going to briefly look back at the history of renewables within the company, particularly the progress that has been made in recent years, and perhaps more importantly, the future opportunities the company now has. And while there are many issues which will determine how the future unfolds, I'd like to leave you with the, what history has shown and I believe is the key requirement for future growth of renewables, both in SSE and in the UK as a whole. The company's oldest renewable assets are its portfolio of hydro stations. Indeed, for many years, hydro featured in the name of the company, initially as the North of Scotland Hydroelectric Board and then Scottish Hydroelectric reflecting the significance of it to the company. The oldest, the oldest hydro asset is now over 100 years old. However, over 80% of the 1,150 megawatts of capacity were constructed during the late 1940s through the 50s and early 60s. Driven by the vision of a few key individuals and most importantly by the bold legislation established by the government of the day to use power from the glens to deliver electricity to the people in the north of Scotland, most of whom were not connected to the by then established national grid. There were, of course, many dissenting voices, particularly about how much it would all cost and also the devastating effect the developments would have on the natural environment of the highlands. Not much, I changed, not much has changed, I guess, other than its wind and no hydro development that today's dissenters are focused on. While great progress was made with hydro development, the dissenters eventually won out and further developments were abruptly halted in the early 1960s when government support for further hydro was withdrawn. The legacy, of course, is that the devastation never materialised and we have an outstanding asset which more than half a century later continues to produce sustainable power, accounting for more over 10% of Scotland's needs or over 1% of the UK's and will continue to do so for as long as we want it to. As an interesting aside, the station pictured on the left is Pitlochry. When the planning application was submitted in 1945, every person in the town objected because of fears for tourism and fishing. Today it is one of the most popular tourist attractions in the area, and any application to demolish the station would be met with wholesale revolt by the local community. An interesting lesson. Wind power for electricity generation is of course not new. The Hydro Board was keen to support new renewable energy sources and was at the frontier of wind development in the UK. Working with John Brown Engineering, an experimental machine seen here on the left was installed in Orkney in the mid-1950s. A more significant attempt to develop wind power took place in the 1980s with the deployment firstly of 250 kilowatt size machines in Orkney, designed and manufactured by James Howden and the Wind Energy Group, a consortium of Taylor Woodrow, GEC, and British Aerospace. This group then went on to develop a record-breaking three megawatt prototype machine shown on the slide, which operated in the late 1980s. And indeed, when I first joined the company, I had the privilege to actually go and visit and, and go up and see that machine in operation. Unfortunately, at, that, at the time, there was an abundance of indigenous fossil fuel and therefore no political support for wind power in the UK at that time. Despite these British companies being at the frontier of wind turbine technology, the industry in the UK died at birth. The story, of course, was very different in Denmark, and we are all very much aware today of this missed opportunity. The next slide pretty much sums up both SSEs and indeed the UK's renewables activity through the 1990s. 
the industry was very much focused or arguably distracted by privatisation, the dash for gas and the deregulation of the energy supply market. SSE was formed by a merger of two of the privatised utilities and the industry as a whole saw a number of mergers and acquisitions throughout this period. The UK was, was self-sufficient in gas and there was little thought that the UK would in the next decade become more reliant on fuel imports for its electricity. Climate change was something discussed only by a few. By the end of the decade, the industry had begun to settle down and the issues of climate change and fuel security were rising fast in the political agenda. This led, of course, to the introduction of legislation in 2000 and the birth of renewable obligation certificates. The obligation placed on electricity supply companies to source ever-increasing amounts of electricity from renewable sources has been the engine behind the successful growth of wind power in the UK and continues to drive investment and growth in the industry. Albeit that the successful formula will, of course, change in the not-too-distant future. SSE were a little slow to react to the opportunities because of focus on other areas of the business in the early 2000s. However, since 2005, we have grown our portfolio of wind assets, both in the UK and Ireland, as shown in the slide, and over 2,000 megawatts of installed capacity is within our grasp in the next couple of years, an achievement we are particularly proud of. This recent rapid growth in our portfolio is exemplified by the completion of three large onshore wind farms in Scotland. Clyde, Griffin and Gordon Bush have a combined installed capacity of over 570 megawatts, an investment of just under £1 billion is delivering over 5% of Scotland's electricity. There is a no more tangible demonstration of how, with strong political will and appropriate legislation, the, sector can deliver, the private sector can deliver ever-increasing amounts of safe, sustainable and secure energy supplies. Of course, while there continue to be many onshore, more onshore wind opportunities, we need to look offshore to meet the UK's ambitious targets. At SAC, we have been building our knowledge and expertise in this relatively new area of the industry. Firstly, through the Beatrice Demonstrator with Talisman, which deployed two of the largest wind turbines in the world at that time in deep water. Our 25% stake in the Walney 367 megawatt project in the Irish Sea, which is now operat fully operational, was an opportunity to work with our partner, Dong Energy, who has more experience in this field than anyone. And of course, the construction of Greater Gabbard with the RWE, which will be completed, completed later this year and has already produced over 400 megawatts, making it the world's largest offshore wind farm for the moment. Along with our partners, this comes to an, over, uh, an investment of over two and a half billion pounds across these two developments. Of course, it is of course important to look back and reflect and learn from our past. Our attention must of course be focused on the future. Over the last few years, we have built up a significant portfolio, probably the largest and most diverse renewable development portfolio in the UK, as can be seen from the slide. It is, of course, only a development portfolio, and there are many challenges ahead to turn what I would call braggawatts into megawatts. Planning issues, grid access, regulatory change, project economics, and capital requirements all have to be addressed, all against the background of increasing energy bills and the social and political impact that this has. I cannot say and would not attempt to predict what our renewables capacity will be in 10 years' time. However, I'm sure the future growth will be a reflection of overall, overall renewables in the, in the UK. The lessons from the past are clear. Strong political support backed up by robust and stable legislation will be the essential ingredient for success. I mentioned there are still many onshore wind opportunities, and, those, and these two developments are excellent examples. Viking on the left is a potential 440 megawatt onshore development which received planning consent in April. Anyone who has been to Shetland will be well aware of the wind resource and why you would want to build a wind farm in Shetland. It is a wind resource probably greater than most offshore wind farms being currently developed or in operation. It is of course a long way from demand and will require the last remaining significantly populated island in the UK to be connected to the national grid. Another interesting point of the project is it's jointly owned by the Shetland Island Trust, which will make it the largest community-owned wind farm in the world. The Shetland Island Trust are showing great foresight by investing some of the revenues they have gained from North Sea oil developments for the long-term benefit of the islanders. The 170 megawatt Clyde extension, currently in planning, is a great example of where extending existing sites can provide a much smoother path through the planning process. 
Of course, the largest future opportunities exist offshore, currently with wind, but ultimately perhaps with wave and tidal. Along with our partners, we have two large-scale projects currently in planning and which we hope to have a decision on in the first half of next year. Along with RWE, we are developing the 500 megawatt Galloper project adjacent to Greater Gabbard and with Repsol, the 1,000 megawatt Beatrice project in the Moray Firth. Both can be delivered in the next five years, making a significant contribution to the UK's CO2 reduction targets. Beyond this, we are jointly developing with partners two round three zones, which have a long-term potential capacity of a further 12 gigawatts. We are also working with partners to develop 800 megawatts of wave and tidal energy sites in and around the Pentland Firth, which only last week was named by as the second of the UK's marine energy parks by the Minister. Of course, it's well known that the cost of offshore uh, is, is challenging and the industry have been set a target by government quite rightly to, to bring those costs down to as close to uh, £100 per megawatt hour as possible. For me, uh, I see sort of four key areas for this. First is clearly competition. Competition in anything helps to bring down costs. Secondly, though, is the scale of machines, uh, and we can see that through the OEMs that the larger and larger machines that are being produced will help and contribute to bringing down costs. Important for us with an SSE, uh, we believe working closely with the supply chain, and hence why we have put together two separate alliances to work with the supply chain, not at the point of financial close, but really from the day one of planning, where we're working with Siemens, Subsea 7 and Bifab in one alliance, and with Mitsubishi in another. And, and the last thing I think which will make a significant contribution to bringing down these costs is not to talk about one project, but to talk about a series of projects. So that as you build one, you're getting ready to start the next, and you move on to that, and that gives greater certainty to the supply chain for them to invest and ultimately bring down cost. Recognising the impact greater wind penetration will have on the UK grid, we are developing two 600 megawatt pump storage schemes, the first of which was submitted into planning earlier this year. Although there is currently insufficient regulatory support or market support to make these developments economic, we believe they will become essential to realising the full potential of inter intermittent wind resources. Similarly, we are also investing in an interconnector project with Nor Norway for the very same reason. I'm sure you will agree the growth of renewables in SSE, which reflects the growth in the UK as a whole, has been a great success story, particularly over the last 10 years. The opportunities available mean the next 20 years could be even greater. However, just as hydro development in the 50s and wind development more recently, this will only be achieved with continuing political support, which it was reassuring to hear this morning from the Deputy Prime Minister and the Secretary of State. As I said earlier, I won't try and predict the future but leave you with the following thought, which applies whether you're a politician, regulator, financier, developer, supplier, or operator. Thank you. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I want to take you through a little bit of a journey uh, on marine renewables. Let me just get the right, right slide to start with. I'm the Chief Executive of NAREC, the National Renewable Energy Centre. We look at both offshore wind and marine renewables, that's wave and tidal. This morning I want to talk about the development of marine renewables in the UK and really look at how we are going to bring this technology to the market, not just for the good of our own uh, national grid network uh, and power generation, but also, we believe, to give an export opportunity for the UK and to help develop this technology in the broader global market. Looking at the marine renewable uh, energy uh, perspective, trying to get some idea of why the UK might be interested in this, it's got the potential to generate something like 20% of the UK's requirements. That's probably a 2030-2040 target um, from the point of view of the, the stage of technology development. We have the largest wave and tidal resources uh, around the coast of Europe and one of the best, certainly, in the, in the world. In the recent uh, House of Commons Select Committee's report, uh, they identified some of the key actions that needed to be taken to make this industry happen. This was partly to get government uh, support to act quickly and give that commitment to uh, marine renewables. 
but it was also to look at the size of the global market and see why the technology developers and the larger players should come into this market. And we identified a 3.7 uh, billion uh, value to the UK by 2020 potential. Out of the eight prototype units, full scale, that are in the water generating today, seven of those are in the UK waters. And perhaps most importantly, from a UK perspective, it plays to the UK's strengths. And I'll come on to those uh, in a second. The technology is still at the R&D stage. And I think while we've got the first prototypes in the water, these are probably series one. We've got another one or two developments of these technologies to get to the point where you would start to see commercial units uh, being deployed, even on small scale. And it's being dominated by SME companies. But it's nice to see that some of the larger companies now taking an interest. Companies like Alstom, like Siemens, and Rolls-Royce. But the SMEs have got the benefit of being able to be innovative and to drive the technology development in the early stages. One of the problems always, though, with this type of uh, energy resources, it's always going to be on the edges of our grid network. So it's going to rely on heavy investment, not just in the technology itself, but the development of the grid networks to capture that energy and take it to market. Hopefully, offshore wind will give some of that development a kickstart in order that marine renewables can benefit at a later date. The output's not controllable. And by this, I mean that wave and tidal, you've really got to take the energy when it's available. It's not like uh, base load gas or, or coal where you can call upon it. So it does have some negative sides uh, from a grid network point of view, uh, but those are small in comparison to the benefits that can be gained. And it's a global opportunity. This is not just applicable in UK waters. If you look around the world, there is great opportunity in wave for places like South Africa, Chile, uh, China, Japan, and in the tidal side, wherever there is strong tidal streams that come from uh, the movement of the oceans of the world. So it's not just a UK opportunity, it is a global opportunity. And the strengths that the UK has, primarily these strengths come from a history in the academic side. And if you look at the black and white picture, 1974, you'll see there Stephen Salter, perhaps the grandfather of wave uh, energy um, development. And back in the 70s at Edinburgh University, he was pioneering work in this area. For a long period, as Jim mentioned, there was a bit of the doldrums in the UK when we didn't see that development of offshore renewables. But in 2000, we began to see a re-emergence of this technology with the development uh, in, the in the wave side sorry, of Limpet on the island of Isla, just off the Scottish coast. And here we saw the first of a commercially um, grid-connected uh, technology, perhaps in the making. The natural uh, resources that I talked about in wave, in the, there are a number of different ways you can describe marine um, resource, and really the important part is the practical one. What can we actually practically take out of the uh, energy in the oceans, either without upsetting the environment, um, but also from a technology point of view? In wave, it's somewhere in the UK, around 40 to 50 terawatt hours. Tidal, there's a potential of around 116, but practically, there's probably only about 20 to 25 terawatt hours. But those are large resources um, of energy that once built, of course, the fuel is free. We have a very strong maritime tradition in the UK, and the oil and gas industry, and more recently, has shown the capabilities of to go into deeper water and into more hostile environments and capture uh, energy uh, resources. And of course, part of that um, strong maritime tradition comes from marine uh, trading activities. So we have a strong commitment to marine trading, which brings us ships and the knowledge of how to do things in the water uh, in other areas, not just in, in the uh, oil and gas industry. We've had a lot of government support, and by this, uh, they've helped us to build infrastructure uh, such as that at NAREC, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later, but also EMEC and WaveHub, which are facilities that are designed to bring on this technology from technology development right through to commercial operation. We've also uh, seen government support in terms of the incentive mechanism, and of course, in the last few weeks, we've seen the ROC mechanism confirmed at five, me uh, five ROCs. Uh, for both wave and tidal. And this is very important for the early stage of development, but of course the target has got to be to get these technologies developed in the future and get down close to grid parity. 
We also have a very strong R&D commitment uh, from the UK Government. So we have a number of agencies that have committed to doing work in the marine renewables area. And this comes right from the uh, research councils at university level, right through the industrial research uh, areas with people like the Carbon Trust, um, the ETI and DEC and TSB themselves. But we also need other support. We need support in planning, in grids, uh, and things like manufacturing and assembly. There's going to be a lot of competition for these marine areas, both for offshore wind and marine uh, renewables over the next decades. So I want to talk just very briefly as to where the technology development is. And most of you will be familiar with this uh, development life cycle, this funnel where we get good ideas at the beginning and put them through a commercialization process. We're spending a lot of time in the UK looking at how we accelerate that development and, and more recently we started to develop a thing called the Catapult Centre. This is an offshore renewable government supported funding uh, in order to accelerate the technology by getting collaborative research between industry and the leading players in the universities. We want to see this technology develop uh, from the prototypes where we are today, around about the one unit uh, in operation, through to hundreds being deployed. And it's very important that we bring the financial community with us. And in, to do that, we make sure that we have technology that's robust, that technology that the investor can believe in, and of course the opportunities to develop that into operating farms. So at that point, we go from technology push into market pool. But looking at the technology readiness levels, uh, it's very important to realize where marine renewables is. If we look at things like offshore wind, you'll see that we're over that peak curve. And this peak is a typical of any development where when you start to do R&D, you think you've got all the answers, but as you go further into it, you realize you've forgotten something or something's more difficult than you thought. So you ride up this, the costs go up, and eventually you reach a peak after which you can start to come down. And marine renewables is probably just about that peak now and very important to recognize that's why we need the five rock support. Once we get over the peak and we start to come down the other side, we'll see the cost come down and of course the support mechanism uh, can then begin to follow that. We talk about learning curves and there's a great deal about learning from doing. Uh, we can come down the blue curve which is a, a smooth path of small technology developments that will enable us to bring down the cost in a controlled slow manner. But for marine renewables, that's not good enough. If we're going to catch up with offshore wind and make sure that we get these resources around the world developed, we've got to come down a quicker curve. And that probably means that we need to go through a curve more like the red one, uh, where the changes come in can actually make ma um, dramatic changes to the, the cost, uh, and we come down a series of curves. Of course, the problem there is that you continually are introducing more risk into the technology development, and as a result of that, um, you, you can be working against yourself if you're not careful. So very important that we get these paths of learning from doing and learning through uh, dramatic technology change um, well thought through in order to ensure that the financial community uh, back us. But the challenge for learning is that we have so many different concepts, particularly in WAVE. And so to do that, we've got to start honing into one or two technologies uh, that can actually make that leap to commercial uh, operation. It also means the supply chain has got to be brought along with us and that they've got to learn and be developing the tier two and tier three technologies in order to support the industry. Perhaps uh, on the tidal side, we're beginning to see a little bit of convergence here with uh, horizontal axis turbines, rather similar to uh, wind turbines coming to the forefront um, with the possibility of, of getting these deployed commercially in the next decade. Wave power, still uh, a number of different technologies and probably a little bit further back uh, in terms of the technology readiness. And we've seen quite a number of attempts here uh, in the UK to harness wave energy. And I think uh, time over the next decade, we will need to see some of that convergence if we're going to see wave power um, successful. We've got leading facilities around the world from tanks in our universities and at Edinburgh University where they're building one of the most advanced tanks combining both wave and tidal stream. And then at full scale uh, facilities such as at NAREC and EMEC in order to bring this technology through to commercial uh, opportunities. 
I've mentioned the Catapult Centre. NAREC is playing a very important part of trying to develop this uh, new initiative to bring funding and support for co collaborative research. And finally, I want to mention a little bit of what NAREC is doing. Uh, we have marine facilities and offshore wind facilities um, for testing components and subsystems uh, at full scale. This month we'll see the first of our marine facilities coming online, with Atlantis coming to test their one megawatt unit on the Nautilus facility, which is a dry crane facility specifically, uh, specifically designed uh, for tidal generators. And that will see the commercial operation of the first um, dedicated drive train test facility in the world. Next year we'll see the 15 megawatt uh, Fujian facility coming online for offshore wind. And in amongst that we've got uh, the opportunity to do testing both electrically and blades. So an integrated set of facilities that when, we, when technologies leave us then go out into the water to places like EMEC or into the wind farms that uh, Jim mentioned earlier. Thank you. Cheers. I'm pleased to say that uh, uh, Greg Barker, the Minister of State uh, for Climate Change, has arrived. We've had a great presentation, Greg, uh, from SSE, from Renewable UK, and from NIRAC. So uh, I think you're going to say a few words, and then maybe we've got time, you can answer a few questions. I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> great. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and I'm really delighted. Uh, to be able to follow on Andrew, not least because um, I had a fantastic visit myself up to uh, uh, Caithness uh, and the Orkneys to open the second UK Marine Energy Park last week uh, in the waters of the Pentland Firth. And uh, if any of you haven't been up there to see what they're doing, I really strongly recommend it. Probably this time of year is better than, uh, than waiting. So uh, go north, I, I would uh, strongly recommend. Um, I also just wanted to say a few words in opening um, to follow on from what I thought was a great speech from the Deputy Prime Minister uh, earlier this morning. And he was very, very clear about the Coalition's commitment to the renewables agenda uh, and the way that we navigate our, our way through a series of you know, grown-up complex issues around subsidy, around targets, but there's absolutely no question of where we are headed and the direction of travel and how ambitious we intend to be. But you know, I'm also aware that you've heard from you know, the Deputy Prime Minister, um, a Lib Dem, and from Ed Davey, another Lib Dem. But let me just reiterate, as a Conservative Minister, in this government. As a Conservative Minister who's been working with David Cameron on this agenda since 2005, what the, Prime, what the Deputy Prime Minister said this morning in terms of uh, the commitment to renewables, he absolutely spoke for the whole coalition, Conservatives as well as Lib Dems, and that we're absolutely committed across government um, to this. I should point out, I'm no normally accompanied by music when I, when I speak. Uh, <laughs> open mic karaoke uh, starts shortly afterwards um, but let's just be so let me just push that uh, point home a bit for you know a bit further the UK needs a strong renewables sector and we are determined to have one it has an absolutely central role to play in helping us reach our emissions reduction goals which are embedded in law uh, under the climate act that was passed by all parties in the House of Commons under the last government at the urging of David Cameron and we are the coalition that has now passed the third carbon budget, stretching by any means. Um, we also need strong renewables because it reduces our imports of uh, fossil fuels and it's worth noting that last year probably the biggest stress factor on the economy was the 35% increase in the cost of wholesale gas that we had to import. Um, it helps, renewables will help in the future keep the lights on here in the UK. It is part of our solution to the security of supply challenge. And so I am very proud to be part of a coalition government that's doing a lot of positive work to accelerate renewable energy deployment. And so I hope you'll forgive me if I just reiterate some of the successes that we've had um, 
because I know many of you are, are uh, sitting on either existing, planned or potential investments. At the end of 2011, 3.8% of our energy came from renewables, putting us on track to meet our first interim target under the Renewable Energy Directive. And in the Q1 of 2012, 11% of our electricity was generated from renewables, an increase of 3% on the same time last year. We really are now starting to pick up steam in terms of deploying renewables. And renewables are also continuing to create jobs and growth. Since April 2011, we have collated industry announcements totaling £11.3 billion pounds confirmed and planned investments with the potential support of around 22,000 jobs. And last week, um, as I mentioned, I was up in uh, the Pentland Firth for the launch of the second UK marine energy park. Now, the UK continues to lead the world in offshore wind with most installed capacity. We have a very strong onshore wind um, industry. We are number one for attractiveness for investment, according to the latest Ernst & Young report. But I do want to stress we are committed to a whole range of technologies, not just on and offshore wind. Um, we want to make it attractive to develop whole areas of the supply chain. So I was delighted last week to open that marine um, energy park, which is going to incorporate the world-leading European Marine Energy Centre, EMAC, which um, Andrew spoke so eloquently about um, just earlier. And while I was up there, I took the opportunity to also visit the North Highland College Engineering Technology and Energy Centre. NHC for short, which is going to provide a wide range of training and education courses in the engineering and energy sector. Taken together with the adjoining Environmental Research Institute, it can now cater for students from the school leaver right the way through to postdoctoral research, delivering skills that we need for the future. Across the board, and this is not just in, uh, I, I do a little dance as well. Um, across the board, um, the UK is skilling up to meet the renewables challenge. Um, now I need to say a few words about the RO, as I know this has been an issue of concern. The DPM spoke about it, Ed Davy spoke about it. Um, the RO review follows a comprehensive, rigorous and evidence-based review of RO subsidies carried out over the past 18 months. A, a review actually that we pulled forward in order to deliver that additional certainty under the new coalition. And I'm very grateful to many of you in this room who actually contributed your thoughts and expertise into that consultation process. Now we expect the support we've announced will bring forward 20 to 25 billion pounds of new investment in the next four years, on top of at least 11.3 billion invested since April 2011. Specifically, offshore wind will be uh, reduced from two rocks in 2013-14 and 2014-15 to 1.9 in 2015-16 and 1.8 in 2016-17 to reflect our expectation and also our hard work with the industry um, that costs will fall as mass deployment takes place and the industry continues to innovate. Support for onshore wind will be reduced to 0.9 rocks until at least March 2014. We will undertake a call for evidence later this year to reassess onshore wind industry costs and if this indicates a significant change in generation costs, we will initiate a review of support levels. The call for evidence will also consider how communities can have more of a say and receive greater economic benefit from hosting onshore wind. And if you look at other countries, other areas, where you have a high deployment level of onshore wind, it is with the active participation and engagement with local communities, and that has to be the way forward. Now, the largest part of the package will support our coal, ploint, coal plant in switching to sustainable biomass fuels, receiving one rock. Coal to biomass conversion in particular are low cost, and will speed the UK's transition away from coal. 
Support levels for marine energy, I'm very glad to say, will more than double from two rocks to five rocks. And that really is a result of the very clear message that I had from the newly established Marine Energy Programme Board that I brought together to really uh, uh, improve the dialogue and engagement between industry and government. Um, and that's going up to uh, 30 megawatts of installed capacity at each generating station. And lastly, there will be no immediate react, uh, reduction in support for large-scale solar. But there will be a further consultation this year on reduced support levels, which is absolutely right given the dramatic falls in costs in this very dynamic um, technology to ensure that subsidy keeps pace with the dramatic falls in the costs of this technology. We've now put in a much improved system of feed-in tariffs for smaller scale solar, which is entirely evidence-based, which is based on deployment, which with predictable, clear digression. But we want to make sure that we take solar on a journey towards grid parity, because if we can reach that by the end of the decade, we have the potential here in the UK for up to 20 gigawatts of solar. The whole landscape on solar has changed dramatically, really, in the last 12 months. And as a result of the reforms, we can be much, much more ambitious about this technology. And I was delighted that reflecting this change, Sharp announced uh, just a, uh, a few weeks ago that they will be relocating the European manufacturing headquarters um, to Wrexham here in the UK and establishing a research and technology centre at Oxford. Overall, the RO package will keep us on track to meet our legally binding 2020 renewable target, delivering around 79 terawatt hours of renewable electricity by 2016-17, 11 terawatt hours more per year than current bands. Whilst this is similar level of, of deployment to the consultation proposals, it is expected to cost around £900 million less, so delivering more clean power at less costs to consumers. And that has to be right. In the current economic climate, this sector has to play its part too in driving down costs, in commercialising sooner, in coming to market quicker and making subsidy go further. That's absolutely right. But I believe in this sector. We in government believe in this sector. And it's, we certainly believe that it can rise to that challenge. These cost reductions are possible because of our policy to bring forward cheaper renewables available now and working with industry together drive down the costs of those such as offshore wind that will be needed for the longer term. Reactions so far to this whole package of measures have been good. For example, Renewable UK has estimated that, and I quote, additional certainty this announcement provides could help the onshore wind sector grow to employ over 12,000 people by 2020 and over a billion pounds added to the UK's economy every year. Uh, Arnold, uh, Arno Bue, uh, Energy and Environmental Infrastructure Director at Ernst & Young, has said, and again I quote, Dex banding announcement is great news for the sector and will bring some short-term relief for the industry as a whole. Gordon McDougall, the Chief Operating Officer at uh, RES, said, the government has sent a clear signal that Britain is open to investment. Now, in addition to the RO package, the launch of the world's first renewable heat incentive in November 2011, and further enhancements to feed-in tariffs and the renewable transport fuel obligation will provide long-term, stable and predictable um, incentive framework necessary to encourage and enable investment in renewable energy. But our ultimate aim remains for the renewable sector to become competitive without the need for subsidy. That has to be our long-term goal. I'm keen to see the industry take up the baton on this and to continue to work with government to bring down costs over the longer term, providing greater benefit to the consumers and the UK overall. But our work on renewables doesn't stop here. Further consultation will be conducted over the summer on new elements of the package we've announced, and we're particularly keen to work with the solar PV sector to get support levels right. 
our work also continues on the introduction of electricity market reform, which provides support for renewables beyond 2017, when the RO will close to new generation. We're also taking action to eliminate the non-financial barriers, such as supply chain bottlenecks and planning, which I know is something of huge concern to the sector, and also grid connection issues. Last year, we published the Renewables Roadmap, setting out for the first time our renewables priorities and how we will overcome barriers to their deployment. As we said in the roadmap, we are determined to drive down the costs of onshore wind, offshore wind through the Cost Reduction Task Force, and we're working to help bring investors and developers together, for example, through the Offshore Wind Investor Conference. And we're reforming the planning system in England and Wales to ensure it no longer acts as a break on sustainable development. For example, we've published a new, much shorter national planning policy framework for England. This will dramatically simplify local planning, strengthen local participation, and achieve that sustainable development. And we committed to, in the 2011 budget to ensuring that all planning applications are dealt with within one year. Officials in the Department for Communities and Local Government are working to give real effect to this policy. Improving grid access for generators and faster delivery of new energy infrastructure are key to enabling deployment of renewable and other essential low carbon generation needed between now and 2020. That is why we've already implemented enduring transmission access reform in the form of a connect and manage regime so that new generation will be able to connect to the grid as soon as their local connection is built without waiting for wider network reinforcement. And we've put in place an innovative regulatory regime to deliver offshore wind energy connections in a cost-effective, timely and secure manner. So, ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, renewable energy not only offers us clean and secure energy that cuts out reliance on imported fossil fuels, it's going to generate billions of pounds of investment, potentially hundreds of thousands of jobs, and is a key growth sector for the UK economy. In the, the uh, last year, between April 2011 and April 2012, a new report by the CBI shows that actually growth in the low carbon sector accounted for 25% of total growth in the UK, growing at almost 5% per annum, even in these challenging economic times. Without doubt, unequivocally, the UK is a great place to invest in renewable energy. David Cameron said when he, when he formed the coalition that he wanted this to be the greenest government ever. He meant it then in 2010, we mean it now in 2012, and we are determined to deliver on that when we go back to the country in 2015. Thank you. Minister, thank you so much for uh, your, your summation. Uh, uh, two personal points. In all the time I've worked with governments, I've never come across a government so joined up, both in planning, in energy, in biz, all trying to encourage investment into, in, into the UK. And it's a great credit to you, the coalition. And, and secondly, uh, as far as law is concerned, uh, just to show how investment is so that we've just spent $60 million uh, building a new center of excellence down in Farnborough. We could have gone anywhere, an American company, we could have gone to Holland, we could have gone to France. We came to UK for tax reasons, for employment reasons, and for good investment reasons. So again, a good place to invest. Um, I think that we're out of time. <laughs> I'd like to thank um, uh, Andrew, Jim, Maff uh, for, for the panel, uh, for giving their views, and also obviously you, Minister, uh, for spending so much time going through the detail. And uh, uh, now it's time for coffee. So thank you very much.